Okay, we're going to introduce our speaker. It's Jason Libby. He's going to do a presentation on Scarborough, no, Maine in World War I, which should be very interesting. Jason. Jason Levy. I uh, did not grow up in Scarborough. <laughs> I have that last name, right? Uh, I grew up in the Augusta. I'm sorry? I bet you're related. I am related to them. I'm actually related to John Libby four times. Uh, so uh, once through that continual paternal line, um, and then uh, my grandmother, my, uh, my paternal grandmother, actually was related to him three times. So, uh, so it kind of works out that way. But uh, so. Uh, I grew up in the Augusta area. Uh, I went to the University of Maine. I got a couple degrees there. I worked in higher education for a period of time. I then ran a, a historic preservation group uh, for seven years as, the, as a, the executive director of, of that society. So I, I absolutely appreciate what you all are doing. Uh, it's, it's a nice community, collective and collaborative. Um, I then uh, I also teach on the side. I work at uh, Central Maine Community College as an adjunct faculty member. Uh, up until recently, I worked as an analyst, uh, policy analyst for the state of Maine. I now work as the higher education specialist for the Department of Education. So um, I have a, a, a an interesting background. Uh, I currently am the chair of the Maine Historic Preservation Commission. I also serve on the Maine State Bicentennial Commission. So. Okay, that's my thing. All right, so uh, you like history. I do. I do <laughs> like history. Actually, uh, I'm the uh, what is it? The archivist for my family, right? Everything that's old or musty <laughs> ends up in my basement, uh, which has a dehumidifier. But my wife doesn't really appreciate that, right? I have like a basement full of too many books and too many things. Um, but uh, I have an appreciation for a lot of different uh, eras uh, in Maine's history in particular, but of course the U.S. One of the things I was talking to Don a little bit about this, I, you know, I, don't, I did not have an ancestry that fought in World War I or the Great War. I had a great uncle uh, that did, uh, but, but not a direct ancestor, and it's, it's always, uh, it, but it's been interesting to me. I, as a Boy Scout, I would visit the veterans' home uh, and meet World War I veterans. Um, certainly knew a few in my community while I was growing up. So it was really the, the, the older generation of, of veterans that I was growing up with, um, so to speak. Uh, and uh, so I, I, at my previous position as uh, in historic preservation, and I'll talk a little bit about this particular individual at the, the far end of this, this presentation, uh, but she was a, a World War I nurse and, and her journal was in the archives of, of the society and so I had a, a great wonderful opportunity to, to transcribe that journal, uh, learn a little bit more about what she experienced and, and I'm sure you'll gain an appreciation for her uh, when I get to that point. Does anybody know who this person is right here? Right. Why would she be important in a presentation on World War One? She was gone by this point. Does anybody have any ideas? I like some audience participation. What's that? Her relatives were from Europe. Well, nurses. So she had a bunch of different grandkids, and three of them were involved, distinctly involved in the Great War. Um, the King of England. Cousins the Kaiser, the you got it, they're all cousins. The Kaiser, Wilhelm, and Tsar Nicholas II were, were all uh, grandchildren of, of Queen Victoria. Um, interestingly, the Tsar and King George got along, they didn't actually like Kaiser Wilhelm, go figure. Um, but uh, it's, it's uh, very interesting if you look at the, the lineage of, of what was going on, the interrelations uh, amongst the, 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 these warring families in, in uh, Europe at that point. And of course, you know, in the U.S. we didn't get into the war until much later, but, uh, and, and there's a couple different reasons for that, obviously. But, so I, I like to just point out some of the things that were going on 100 years ago. Now, this isn't perfect. I don't have a May 6th. I have, this is May 7th, 1918. 
uh, from the Lewiston Evening Journal. Uh, but you can see some of the things I'll probably touch upon during the course of the presentation. U-boats, um, you know, certainly that's one of the reasons why the U.S. got involved in World War I in the first place. Um, casualty lists on the front page, General Pershing. Um, uh, you know, and there was a series of spring offensives that were going on. Uh, at this point, uh, the Germans were, were uh, uh, fighting back. Uh, against the entrenched British, French, and, and, and uh, American troops at that point. So I'd just like to, to start it off with that. So, you know, Maine is very well known for its uh, sacrifices and involvement and participation in the American Civil War. You know, with over 72,000 uh, individuals from the state, sailors and soldiers, that participated. And although we, we had been, you know, uh, expanding our reach uh, as a nation following the Civil War and certainly we did have our participation in the Spanish-American conflict uh, or war uh, 20 years prior to, to our involvement in World War I. Uh, this was really our, our first new major war in, in a half a century and uh, interestingly this, this picture right here is it's a Norman Rockwell cover for the Red Cross magazine uh, but the article it's, it says blue and gray equals khaki uh, and this was really that kind of that first uh, real major uh, unifying kind of uh, conflict, you know, for, for the United States, uh, where you still have, you know, veterans of, the, of both sides that are still alive. Their, their grandchildren really are the ones that are setting foot on, on European soil, um, really for the first time. Um, so I, I, I've always found this to be kind of an interesting thing. Now, only 35,000 participants from the, from the state of Maine uh, were involved in World War I, and not all of them went overseas, and uh, certainly not an insignificant number. Um, but, so here's, your, here's a quick list of Scarborough natives. Uh, either they were born or they were residing in Scarborough at the time. Uh, obviously, a, a couple of them, uh, Millard Gower, uh, Lucian Libby, and uh, Roland Seavey didn't return. Uh, unfortunately. Uh, two of them died of disease. Uh, Lucian Libby, of course, um, uh, not a relative of mine, but you know, down the tree at one point. Um, obviously, I think you've all seen this picture that's in the library in here. Uh, after his, um, he, he died of wounds in October of 1918. Uh, there was a, a, a Lucian T, or Lucian Taylor Libby Fund that was created. Um, for the purchase, purchase of books for the Scarborough Public Library. So, uh, are you all familiar with this picture that's in the, I hope? Yeah. Great, wonderful. Can I say something? Yes, please. Uh, I saw two of my relatives on there, uh, Otis Leary and yeah. Raymond Leary. And who are they to you? They, my grandmother, these were my grandmother's two brothers. And they both survived. Excellent. Um, and if there's someone that's interested, um, I do have uh, what the Adjutant General of the State of Maine put out a request for anyone that uh, participated in the war, and that included a number of females uh, who served as, as nurses. Um, uh, this is a one volume. The other volume is actually propping up the projector, but. Um, you know, if you're interested, I, I have an email. I can send you some documentation if you're if you're interested in learning more about you know, your your great uncles or someone else has someone that they're interested in learning about. I can, I can provide some information as well. So, out of those 35,000 individuals, a lot of them actually uh, were were recruited, uh, not necessarily just for U.S. forces, but this is a British Canadian recruiting office in Monument Square. Uh, prior to the U.S.'s involvement in the war, um, uh, something along the lines of 3, 000, over 3,000 Canadian-born uh, soldiers uh, that were living in Maine at the time uh, did sign up. Now, some of them went to the British Canadian forces. Uh, some of them uh, participated in the American Expeditionary Forces. Uh, but the, the interesting part is if you look at some of the, the individuals that did serve and were even recognized for their valor or service, some of them were, were born in Turkey, uh, which would be a warring nation. Some of them were born in Germany. Uh, there's a, a gentleman by the name of Albert Click who was uh, living in the Fairfield area 
Uh, he actually received a Distinguished Service Cross. He, his brother, uh, had been uh, were born in Germany and were sent overseas to go basically fight their cousins. But you know, uh, it's it's uh, interesting when you look at at the very least at, at some of the nice national identities um, that the troops from Maine actually uh, uh, represent. So. This is the St. Croix uh, Vanceboro Bridge uh, in uh, in Washington County, and the interesting part about this is, in February of 1915, a, a Corporal Warner uh, Werner Horn from he was a German uh, soldier, traveled through Mexico, uh, through through the United States, ended up in Maine, and of course we weren't involved in the war, but his ultimate goal was to blow this bridge up. Uh, so he stayed in Vanceboro. Uh, he uh, ended up putting a, an explosive on this bridge. Uh, of course, the Canadians were using this for, for transportation through uh, the United States um, and uh, detonated it, but it only minimally damaged the bridge. Um, they, they did catch him. Uh, they extradited him to Canada, and a couple years later, they, they uh, determined that he was insane. And, and, uh, um, but, you know, interestingly, he was wearing his uniform. Uh, he was, he was uh, technically trying to stay undercover while he was in the U.S. Um, until he actually placed the bomb, so it wasn't a, a spy issue, per, perhaps. Uh, very interesting. There, there were also other situations later on. Uh, there was a German uh, passenger ship that was docked in, uh, outside of Bar Harbor as the U.S. entered the war. Um, uh, or actually, I'm sorry, when, when the war actually originally broke out. Uh, we detained that ship in Bar Harbor for a number of months. It was sent down to, to New York, um, and eventually the gold and everything else that was on the ship, because it was kind of in limbo land for a couple of years, um, uh, the U.S. ended up securing that ship and turning it into a, a military transport ship. So uh, the U.S. kind of did its preparedness really during the, the border crisis in Texas in, in 1916. Uh, a number of National Guard units throughout the United States were called up, those that were in Maine, uh, particularly the 2nd Maine Infantry. Uh, this would be uh, the, the uh, regiment that was per primarily dispersed throughout the, the state. Uh, there were uh, companies based out of Lewiston, Farmington, Dover, uh, and, and elsewhere. And uh, they were all called in June of 1916 to uh, go to the muster grounds, which was Camp Keys in Augusta. Uh, where they uh, redrilled uh, and prepared themselves for uh, being sent to to Texas, and that was obviously part of the whole Pancho de Villa. Uh, via, uh, General Pershing, of course, was was seeking him out. Uh, there were concerns about attacks on on Texas uh, towns and communities and crossing the border at the time. So these are troops uh, that are leaving uh, from Bangor. Uh, uh, the main portion of the 2nd Maine Infantry Regiment. Uh, interestingly, the University of Maine band actually signed up together to serve uh, down in Texas uh, at that point, which is kind of interesting. Okay, there again. Uh, this is Lewis Burrow, uh, Barrows. He actually ended up becoming governor of Maine. Uh, he was a member of the University of Maine band. He had actually graduated the spring just before uh, the uh, mustering of soldiers in, in June of that year. Uh, he ended up serving uh, during, during the Texas border crisis, but, but not during World War I itself. Uh, and, and I find this piece a little interesting. Uh, as they, a lot of these soldiers were serving down in Texas, obviously it's a little warm, but they were sending some letters back, and one letter that was published in a, a local newspaper said, you know, please send us some, some goods, you know, send us uh, some cards, or." Uh, but don't send us any wool hats or scarves. <laughs> this is the William P. Fry. Uh, this was the first American ship that was sunk in World War I. Uh, it was sunk in 1915. It was bath built. Um, so this was the, one of those things that, that continued to be of concern. Uh, Governor Carl Milliken, once it became very clear that the U.S. was going to be entering the war, of course it hadn't been declared yet, uh, all the president and, and, and others had, had asked states to prepare themselves, had been uh, recruiting new, uh, new soldiers for a period of time, uh, the preceding several months. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't need to read this for you, but, but the idea was that, uh, the idea was that it wasn't just recruiting soldiers, 
It was also a whole host of other things. So the, the governor put together this committee of 100 uh, on public safety, and the idea was that they wanted to bring um, a number of influential leaders, community leaders, state leaders together in order to prepare the state uh, and the communities for war. So that might include uh, uh, food production. It would include uh, war industries, uh, and particularly shipbuilding. Um, it included, uh, you know, uh, saving things. So, for for example, uh, fundraising, war saving stamps, uh, loan loan drives, and a whole host of other things. Uh, another part of that, of course, was this was the first. This is a picture of the first time that Canadian troops were allowed to to uh, march through the state. Um, as you may know, uh, Portland was really Canada's ice free port for a number of, of years. Uh, that, that started back in the mid 19th century when um, the Grand Trunk Railroad but, uh, was, was actually constructed and John Poor in Portland uh, did a number of, of, of things in order to encourage that. Uh, but this was a, was a chance for Canadian troops to get uh, to an easier spot where they could uh, embark for, for Europe. So this was in April of 1917. This is Brownville Junction. So again, that, that committee of 100 uh, they, they were working to recruit people, uh, you know, uh, unmarried men without dependents, 18 to 45 years old. Uh, please sign up, basically. Uh, th this was not at this point when the draft happened. Of course, that was a little bit later. Uh, but, but eventually, of course, all of all the individuals that fit within their parameters uh, would be asked to, at the very least, register, which is one of the really wonderful things if you're doing research on, on an ancestor. I, those World War I draft cards are, are an excellent source of information if you're, if you're interested in and it, it. It certainly includes a number of individuals who didn't serve. Uh, this is a recruiting officer and, and uh, you know, everybody was, was recruited. Uh, and, and I say that this is the Passamaquoddy chief uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, Princeton, uh, in Washington County. Uh, and, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more, but a number of members from Company I of the 103rd Regiment uh, were, were actually, actually Passamaquoddy tribe members. Uh, this is a, 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 a Naval Reserve uh, Training Center uh, in Portsmouth. Um, and uh, these, these guys, the, the guy who wrote this said, well, we're getting ready for our morning ins inspection at 9.30. Uh, this was in uh, June of 1917. But one of the interesting things, of course, we're, we're a coastal state, um, and coastal defense was very important for us. Now, the, the Committee of 100, one of the other items that they really focused on was, was being able to form these, uh, potentially form coastal patrol units. Uh, and coastal patrol units might be is something as small as running around in, in uh, little motorboats. Um, there certainly were other uh, things that were, were, were constructed particularly for uh, shallow boats, and, and I'll show you some of those in a little bit. Uh, these are some new, new recruits uh, in front of the Rockland Post Office uh, in the summer of 1917. But, so, it's not just, uh, and I, I should say, uh, the, the Coast Guard, for example, was put underneath uh, the Navy for the, per for the duration of, of World War I at this point. Now, um, there were three di distinct naval districts within the state. Uh, there's the one that's, that kind of is in the Portsmouth Kittery area. Uh, there's Portland Harbor and the, the extension all the way up to, to the Kennebec River. And then uh, that next section that goes from there all the way to, to uh, uh, Eastport. And uh, obviously in, in Portland Harbor, uh, not on Peaks Island, uh, there, are, there were installations for, for World War II in particular, but there were a number of, of fort uh, that had been put into uh, Portland Harbor everywhere from even since the 1812 uh, war, but, but uh, the Civil War and, and going through what they call the Endicott period, which would be just prior to the 20th century. So this is a 12-inch disappearing gun uh, that was uh, at Fort Williams. Now they've been trying to restore Battery Blair for, for a number of years. This, this actually, there would be 18 privates that were uh, part of this, this uh, gun uh, team. There would be a gunner, uh, a, a gun chief, and, a, and a, a spotter, and she's up here. So 21 people would work on this. And they took everything from uh, loading the, the, the uh, artillery shell to placing it on the carriage to 
obviously putting it into the, the, the gun itself and you can see um, now these these shells could go 10 miles out to sea you know they, they didn't fire a lot of this these off at Fort Williams because of the head uh, you know the lighthouse that's there obviously they didn't want to damage it but you know most of the time when they when they would shoot these off it would break a lot of windows in the area so uh, it wasn't something they did a lot and you can see the Again, it's, it's, it's called a, a disappearing gun because it, it raises up, it shoots, and then it comes back down. So it's, it's, it has that line of protection. Uh, this is Fort Levitt. Uh, Fort Levitt was another one of the, the, the Portland Harbor uh, uh, Coastal Artillery Corps forts. Um, there was actually a hotel that was just behind it. Uh, that's actually how this picture was taken. Uh, it was taken from a balcony of the hotel. The hotel burned actually during World War I, so it's no longer there. Uh, troops at Fort McKinley, so Fort, um, these are non-commissioned officers at Fort McKinley uh, with the parade ground and, and uh, some barracks in the background. Uh, and, and this is a wireless signal station. Now, uh, wireless signal station is really just, it's, it's, it's radio for, for purposes of, of, of uh, sending messages up and down the coast. There, there were some private radio stations during this time period. The U.S. government actually put uh, a, a, a prohibition on the use of, of private stations primarily because they wanted to ensure because it was still a fairly new uh, system uh, to ensure that the, the military use of, of the wireless system was uh, the primary use so um, this was a, a, a signal station that was put into uh, Fort Levitt uh, around 1908 uh, and uh, these are a couple of the guys that, that uh, ran that and these would send signals down the Atlantic coast. So this was this was actually all part of what would be considered the the first district, which would include Boston. A 12-inch mortar uh, piece. Uh, there would be anything from uh, machine gun posts to uh, uh, something along these lines. Uh, uh, items that would be an anti-aircraft, so to speak, type guns, uh, and a whole host of other things. This is actually kind of interesting because it, it's, it's the Lemoyne coaling station. Uh, if you're familiar with Lemoyne, this was actually a, 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 a naval facility that was used by the North Atlantic Fleet. Um, of course, at this point during World War I, it was more important for ships to be powered by diesel. Uh, so coal had kind of gone, had already gone, gone out of its uh, use. Uh, so in 1903, this was constructed. Uh, about a decade later, they kind of put it to rest, but by the time World War I opened up, uh, they decided that it would be best to at least reopen the facility to use to store artillery uh, or other uh, um, uh, needs for, for the North Atlantic Fleet. So I mentioned uh, shore patrols, or I, I should say uh, um, the, the coastal patrols. So uh, there were a number of those facilities. Uh, Booth Bay was an important one. A lot of this really had to do with the shipbuilding uh, industry in the state of Maine, um, and and we'll we'll talk a little bit more about those. But uh, there were there weren't just government built boats or things that were designed just for government uh, use. Uh, this is actually a yacht, uh, the Lindonia. Um, this was Cyrus Curtis. I don't know if you're familiar with Cyrus Curtis. He was a publisher that was from Maine, uh, but he was living in Philadelphia. Uh, the Saturday Evening Post. This was his personal yacht, and he gave it to the state of Maine to be able to be used for um, the purposes of, of uh, shore patrol, coastal patrols. And there were about a dozen, a dozen and a half boats that were donated by private individuals for the purposes of, of uh, um, you know, maintaining some sort of searching on the, on the coast in, in the state. Well, why? Okay, so this is the leftover crew of the Robert and, and Richard. This was a boat that was out of Gloucester, Massachusetts. Uh, they were off Cape Porpoise in July of 1918 when they were boarded by a U-boat. And um, they were put on a, a couple dinghies and, and set adrift and they blew up the ship. But the interesting part about this was uh, that they, they had the chance to converse with one German officer. He was the second in command of the U-boat. And he spoke pretty good English, and, they, and they, it came about that he ended up telling them, oh, by the way, I, I've, I've, uh, I have a house in Bar Harbor. I've lived here since 1898. So, you know, wow. <laughs> kind of interesting. 
but again, you know, this this is a, 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 just a couple weeks after that particular boat um, had had been sunk. Um, uh, you know, nine foot nine uh, fishing schooners in just one week um, were, were taken down and, and sent to the to the bottom of the sea. So shipbuilding obviously has been important in the state of Maine. I mean, the first uh, ship to be built in North uh, North America was was in 1607 uh, at Popham. Uh, and we obviously have had this kind of, uh, uh, you know, legacy of shipbuilding in the state, particularly surrounding Bath Iron Works, but, but uh, uh, obviously Portsmouth and Kittery and elsewhere. Just prior to the war, the, the industry had actually been in, in pretty rough shape. Uh, there were only a handful of, of shipbuilding facilities that were still uh, really scraping by. Uh, but once the war opened up, I mean, uh, uh, excuse me. Once the uh, the war opened up in in general, not just with the U.S. entry, uh, there was obviously a demand for for ships, and it wasn't just military ships. It wasn't convoy or destroyers necessarily. It was including merchant ships, uh, you know, to send supplies overseas, um, transport ships, etc. So this is one ship that was built in East Booth Bay by the Hodgson Brothers Shipyard, which is still around. This is actually a sub chaser, and this would have been used by a unit out of Booth Bay Harbor. Um, this was a fairly small boat, it was a small crew. They would go and, and because it, was a, it didn't displace a lot of water, they could go in and out of a number of coves. And really the intent behind this was to, to look out for subs. Uh, and so if they were, uh, if they for, for example found something, they could use uh, depth charges, they could call in some other ships uh, to the area, but, but again, part of this whole coastal patrol thing. Uh, this was the USS Georgia. This was actually Bath Iron Works' only battleship that they um, that they sent off and constructed. This was uh, uh, put to sea in 1904. It did see some action during World War One. It was primarily used as a training ship, but it did do some patrols in the in the, in the Atlantic as well. Uh, this is the the USS Casson. These are uh, what they would call four stack. Uh, 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 destroyers, um, they, they were actually classified something before that, light cruisers, but uh, there were a series of these that were built at Bath Ironworks. Um, this one, which was the sister ship to the previous one, this is, uh, was actually uh, sent to the uh, Treasury eventually after following World War I and used as a, uh, a run chaser. So it was used during Prohibition to uh, track down the underground elements that we're sending alcohol into to the state. Uh, and then at Portsmouth, uh, we even had a submarine that was constructed. This is the L-8. Uh, there were a series of what they called Lake Series submarines that were constructed um, at a number of different shipyards in the U.S. This one uh, in particular was important for, for, for the state. Uh, it was the, the eighth one. And uh, uh, it, was, it was actually, uh, April of 1917 when it was finally sent out to, to sea, but it, by the time it did its shakedown uh, it, and was going to be sent overseas uh, across the Atlantic, uh, the war ended. So it was actually never involved in a, in a military sense. Um, and then this is the USS uh, Chester. This was a, a ship that I'll, I'll show another picture of later, um, but this was actually used during the uh, Mexican crisis. Uh, it actually was used down at Veracruz. Uh, Veracruz is uh, the, the major port in Mexico. Uh, of course, it was Cinco de Mayo the other day, so the French troops that were uh, defeated at Puebla, the Battle of Puebla, um, actually landed at Veracruz. U.S. troops, um, fast forwarding a number of years later, uh, were actually uh, landed at Veracruz as well. Uh, they guarded the port there, uh, but they, they uh, sent in marine detachments to pull some, some American citizens and others uh, out, of, out of Mexico during, uh, during that border crisis same, uh, period of time as well. So, uh, and I always hate it when they say ex-presidents, it should be former president, but this is former President Taft. Uh, he was uh, asked by President Woodrow Wilson to go around the, the, the country and to help drum up support, not necessarily the whole gun ho thing, but, but being able to, to promote the, the benefits of of, of uh, assisting the war effort, whether that's through, uh, you know, recycling efforts or uh, food production and, and et cetera. And this is him in May of 17 uh, at Holton. 
Uh, and certainly war industries were important. Uh, this is a group of women at the Portland Company uh, in Portland. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with that facility. Uh, th this was originally created uh, for the construction of locomotives. Eventually they were uh, constructing pulp digesters for, in support of the pulp and paper industry in the state. Uh, but by the time the war broke out in Europe, uh, the, the owner, of the, the, the lead owner of the factory at that point thought, well, we, maybe we should get into artillery production. And, and so these were uh, a number of uh, artillery shells that were sent overseas uh, to be used by the French and, and British. Um, and of course, eventually by uh, American forces. This is the uh, packing uh, section of, of the Portland Company. These are the pre-Rosie the Riveters, right? Um, Andy the artillery shell packer or something like that, I don't know. <laughs> But food production was very important. I've, I've mentioned it a couple times. Um, obviously, Maine, uh, the Holton area, or wherever, um, you know, food, uh, potatoes were in particular. Every potato you eat is a bullet fired point blank at a made in Germany piece. I, I find that one to be f fairly uh, humorous, but um, food will win the war. Don't waste it. This is outside the Bangor Post Office. And it wasn't just food, we didn't, you know, but there, there's obviously the comforts of home, right? So, uh, and, and I didn't serve in the military, but I know when my cousin was overseas in Iraq in 2004, it was surely something he appreciated when a gift package from home showed up. So these Boy Scouts uh, from Andover, Maine, uh, went out and collected 180 books uh, to be able to be sent out to the soldiers and sailors overseas, which was which was a nice comfort at home. Uh, these Farmington Normal School students were, uh, you know, volunteering for the Red Cross. They were making bandages. They were making those comfort packages as well that were sent overseas. Of course, Farmington Normal School is now the University of Maine Farmington. And then a lot of the ambulances that were sent overseas were donated and sponsored by, uh, you know, uh, well-to-do or community or uh, what have you. Um, certainly an, an important part, but a new part of, of the war um, in particular. This is a, a, a golf tournament that was held at, at Poland Spring in July of 1918. They raised $5,777, which was a considerable amount of money. Um, there was a, a, a team of four really young golfers, one of them Bobby Jones, I'm sure most of you know who he is. Uh, he was 16 years old at the time. Uh, he lowered the course record actually while he was at Poland Spring. Uh, but but they, uh, the, uh, the Dixies, as they, as they called them, they, they were all from the South, they went around the United States to raise money for the American Red Cross for, in particular, for the war effort. So, uh, so you know, as we started to send troops over, this is the Patriots Day, April 19, uh, 1917 in Bedford. Um, uh, this, you know, I was talking to Don earlier, he, he mentioned how his, his grandmother was involved with preparedness uh, uh, you know, and, and preparedness was something that was important. Those pre 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 excuse me, preparedness parades, those preparedness uh, activities and events were certainly um, you know appropriate to kind of get people you know going and moving forward and, and supporting the war effort. And it's obviously not to say not everybody was for the war. Um, you know, certainly there were there were individuals who spoke out against the war effort, but I'm not going to cover that necessarily in this. Um, these are soldiers that are leaving Farmington. So the second main infantry I mentioned earlier, they, they were this, the uh, National Guard unit that was sent uh, to the Texas border uh, in 1916. Once the uh, U.S. entered the war in, in April of 1917, one of the things that the federal government did was they federalized a number of the National Guard units. And that was no different for the second main infantry here in the state of Maine. Uh, so what they ended up becoming was part of the uh, 103rd Regiment. Now the 103rd Regiment was the second main. It was also the first New Hampshire Regiment, um, but it was primarily the second main uh, uh, infantry members. The 103rd Regiment became part of what's known as the 26th Division, which is a division that's still in service now. It's also known as the Yankee Division. Now, unlike the Civil War, of course, uh, today we our military forces don't send a community and a regiment or a community and a company. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. The Sullivan Brothers during World War II is a perfect example of uh, 
you know, you could have a, a ship go down with a, a, a series of brothers, or in a situation like the Civil War, you could have a regiment involved in a, in a very bloody battle, and uh, the community could suffer greatly because they would lose, you know, uh, a dozen or two dozen uh, of their young men uh, to, to, to war. So, uh, but in World War I, they still were doing this kind of uh, community basis situation. So aside from the regular army units, the National Guard units uh, of, from Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine were all put into the 26th Division, which is why they called them the Yankee Division. Um, and so uh, it wasn't uh, a member of the Yankee Division. This is Cor uh, Corporal Harold Taylor Andrews. If you're this Andrews Square in Portland, uh, he was a Hebron Academy graduate. He was at the University of Maine when the war broke out. He left. Um, went overseas. He was part of an engineering battalion. Uh, he was Maine's first casualty of war. Now this is the, the plaque that's in the State House uh, uh, to uh, memorialize him. Uh, he wasn't armed. Uh, he had a pick and a shovel. And he and his uh, unit were attacked by a German uh, uh, unit and, and of course he didn't survive. Um, so uh, one of the other early arrivals, uh, this is Private Grover. He was from South Portland. Uh, interestingly, the 14th U.S. Engineers were primarily made up by uh, railroad folks, and so uh, and primarily made up by Maine Central Railroad individuals. So uh, he was an employee of Maine Central Railroad that worked in Portland, uh, and a whole host of other men from from uh, Maine Central Railroad were uh, intentionally recruited by the United States government to be a part of the 14th U.S. Regiment. There were a couple other. Uh, engineering regiments that were in the same situation and those were sent overseas in order to prepare uh, the troops arrivals and that's you know part of the infrastructure needs that were were, um, were needed uh, to, to obviously transport troops around Europe. Uh, this is a coastal artillery corps unit they, they actually ended up becoming the 54th but this was uh, a, a, a group of men from uh, this one right here is uh, Sergeant Pearson, he was from uh, uh, Falmouth actually, uh, but these batteries were all part of the, the 54th CAC, the Coastal Artillery Corps, and they, they would have primarily been stationed at Fort Williams or McKinley or where have you. Uh, interestingly, our, most of the troops that we sent overseas as a part of this uh, Coastal Artillery Corps, they did a lot of training, so they would get uh, broken apart um, from their unit and placed in a different one in order to help them train because you know a guy from Nevada probably doesn't have a lot of experience on the Coastal Artillery Corps, right? I mean it's just a given. A lot of our guns that actually were placed at Fort Williams and elsewhere were also actually uh, taken out of the installations and sent overseas to serve as guns uh, in France as well. Um, this is another individual, I like this image, I don't know who staged it, uh, especially with this guy right here pointing a rifle and a miniature to this guy, but hey whatever. Um, this is uh, Lawrence Merriman. He was also uh, he was from Harpswell. Uh, he he was also a student at the University of Maine when the war broke out. He left his studies, uh, went overseas. He was also one of these replacement coastal artillery corpsmen. He he actually was pla uh, placed within um, a corps that was based out of uh, Virginia, uh, Northern Virginia in particular, but also Maryland, uh, to to serve as kind of an expert. Uh, and, and uh, help train some other troops from another area. Uh, and, and this is uh, uh, Frank Hume, Colonel Frank Hume. Now he, I, I met, I've mentioned the 103rd, he actually was from Holton, he was a, a very smart individual, he was considered for West Point, but because of his poor eyesight, he, he did not receive a commission, so he went to Harvard instead, because you know, that's, that's a bummer um, to go there. And uh, very, very smart, very beloved by his troops, uh, very, very well appreciated. Um, and so the 103rd actually, again, the, the former 2nd Maine Regiment folks, were sent overseas. Uh, this is obviously in the trenches over in France. These are uh, duck boards, so these, these kept, uh, kept the, the men from walking around in the mud. Um, uh, this is in uh, uh, the spring of 1918. And obviously barbed wire became a, a, a defensive tool. Um, you know, the point of barbed wire really was to funnel troops into uh, an area where they would, you know, basically be in a, a fish in a barrel kind of situation. But 
Um, you know, uh, so these are mem members of the 103rd Regiment that were stringing wire uh, in, in uh, the summer of 1918. Uh, William Ingraham was the Assistant Secretary of, of uh, War, and he was actually, uh, just prior to that, uh, Mayor of Portland. Uh, he served in this capacity for about a year uh, before health problems uh, uh, encouraged him to uh, retire from his post. There are a number of other individuals. Now this is um, uh, uh, Gardner, William Tudor Gardner. He ended up becoming governor of Maine, uh, but he was a member of, of the uh, Pioneer Regiment that was sent overseas. Um, these were actually originally Coastal Artillery Corps members, uh, but there was a great need for folks to build roads, build bridges, build, uh, you know, dig trenches and a whole host of other things. Unfortunately, in the 1950s, uh, he had become a pilot at that point. Um, he was flying uh, to uh, uh, an infantry regiment reunion uh, in Pennsylvania where he crashed his plane and, and died. Um, but uh, uh, this was the, the Gardner family. This is, this is what Gardner means, that um, is, is their family. Uh, very interesting individual. Sumner Sewell was also a governor for Maine. He's our only flying ace. He got seven uh, confirmed kills. Uh, or you know, plane uh, kills, so to speak. This is him coming out of his, uh, uh, the wreckage of his first plane that he shot down. Uh, these are some French troops that, are, that have uh, arrived on the scene. Um, he, he was from a very well-to-do family. Uh, he, when the war broke out, he served, uh, volunteered to serve as an ambulance driver. Um, shortly thereafter, he had an opportunity to join uh, an aero squadron, uh, which he, he obviously did. Uh, he ended up becoming governor of Maine for a couple terms, and then uh, later uh, served as a uh, airplane executive. Go figure. Anybody know who this is? Chase. Yeah. Great. You know, last time I was at a thing, somebody nobody had a clue who it was. Like, but look at the smile. Come on. How do you not know that's Margaret Chase Smith? Um, Margaret Chase Smith is one of those individuals. It was uh, the home front aspect of things. Uh, you know, uh, um, you know, serving and, and volunteering for the Red Cross was was an important. Uh, aspect of, of the community support for the, for the war movement. Anybody know who this is? No one ever gets this. Oh, you got it. Yeah, but you, you, you probably already knew that, right? You know this story? Does it look like him? Good. Well, because sometimes he doesn't look like you know. Um, how old do you think he is there? 17. Okay, I got 17. 16. 16? Any, any other guesses? I'm not saying either one of you are wrong. It's just. So he was 15 at the time. Um, I'm sorry? Rudy Valley. Rudy Valley? Rudy Valley, yeah. So he, he signed up when he was 15 years old and he served for 47 days. They booted him out once they found out he was 15. He probably didn't even have hair on his chest. Um, but, you know, he, he got his service time in um, and uh, eventually joined the American Legion. Uh, but uh, yeah, good old Rudy Valley. Um, this is so I mentioned earlier the Passamaquoddy tribe, and I, I part of me I, I, I hate to always say this, but uh, so these are members of the Company I of, of the 103rd Regiment. Um, there were tw over 22 individuals from the Passamaquoddy tribe that participated in either the Canadian Expeditionary Forces or their American Expeditionary Forces. The interesting part about these individuals is they're not even American citizens at the time. They didn't even have the right to vote. But they're still fighting for the United States or Canada. Um, this, this one right here um, is particularly uh, interesting. His name is uh, uh, Moses Neptune. Moses Neptune uh, was the son of the, the uh, Passamaquoddy uh, governor. Um, and he and a couple other members of the Company I, uh, Company I uh, were killed in uh, um, uh, in battle on November 10th, 1918, the day before the war ended. Speaking of the day that the war ended, now I really like this. Now I bought this journal on eBay because uh, I'm one of those guys, um, and this is uh, Winfield Scott Hodgins. Okay, and uh, he's an interesting guy. He was from the Brewer area, um, and I have some of his paperwork, but. Uh, the, the interesting part was when I was working on this book with the state historian Earl Shuttleworth, um, he reached out to somebody who had a whole bunch of things. 
And one of the things that that guy happened to have was a picture of Winfield Scott Hodgins. Um, so I was able to marry a picture with a journal, which was really nice. But, um, you know, war stopped at 11 a.m. was something uh, to see the finish. But the bells were, kept me up and woke me up. Well, he had been on night duty the night before. So he was not that pleased that the war ended, to be honest, because of all the hoopla. Uh, so he finally got back to bed. The next day he talked about it. Well, I guess it's nice that the war ended. He finally got some sleep. I guess he felt better. I don't know. Um, the end of the war, burning the Kaiser in effigy, right? This is in Corinth. Um, I mentioned the USS Chester earlier. It was a bath built ship. Uh, this is a picture taken from the US Chester of an ice cutter ship. Now, at the conclusion of the war, of course, we weren't at peace right off. Um, there was just kind of a, a temporary lull, right, until we, we finally signed a, a tr the Treaty of Versailles in particular. But um, so there were, there were actually inspections of German ports. So this was an inspection of a German port, a northern German port. Um, in uh, February of 1919. Um, this guy right here is Captain Guy Sweat. And at the last presentation I gave, somebody said, are you kidding me? I knew him. And I was like, really? That was really nice that uh, somebody knew him. His, his dire war journal just actually got uh, found uh, last week as well. Um, and it's the entirety of his time overseas. The, the one reason why I like to, to show uh, Captain Sweat, um, aside from that handsome face of his, um, is that he was a member of the 103rd, but he actually ended up transferring to the 32nd Division, which is a Red Arrow. Now, the only reason why I say all that is, the war didn't end November 11th and people went home, right? Some, some got, were still hanging out in January, February. Some of them didn't make it home until April. He was a part of the Army of Occupation in Germany, uh, and it was almost an entire year before he was able to be sent back home. So. To kind of, and it, this is a complete wrap up, but um, just showing you, so we had over a thousand uh, of our troops that didn't make it back home, um, you know, and uh, there wasn't, uh, uh, certainly the 103rd was the major regiment that, uh, uh, the contingency that went, went overseas, um, and there were certainly some devastating battles, in particular in July of 1918, where a number of members of the 103rd um, didn't make it home or distinguish themselves in, in battle, um, but you know it's 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 interesting because it, you know it's not as dramatic as as again as the Civil War or, or other conflicts. But you have to really think about it from the terms of we may have sent uh, troops over in October of 1917, but a lot of them weren't put into the field until a few months later, um, and so really uh, most of our U.S. troops were not in true harm's way. Um, for much more than nine months, uh, it wasn't as, as as long as you know obviously other other uh, conflicts. So you know they came back home. This is a, a contingency of, of men that were a member of the Saint Augustine Church in Augusta, which is where I grew up. Um, none of my family members are in there, but um, you know obviously these are the type of things that that happen everywhere throughout the state. Um, General Edwards is right here. He was the general that was in charge of the 26th uh, Division, which included the 103rd Regiment. This was just after their arrival um, back home in, in uh, uh, early 1919. Here he is in Bangor. And General Pershing, uh, after the, the war ended, General Pershing kind of did that whole, you know, hero's tour, really. Um, and everybody wanted to see him. This is. Uh, uh, he's at Farmington Normal School. Um, at this point, the, the chorus of women had just sung him this uh, original tune that they had written for him. Uh, the Blaine House, which most of you I'm sure are familiar with, was uh, not given to the state of Maine until uh, just after the conclusion of the war. It was loaned to the, to the uh, state in order for them to hold uh, meetings, emergency meetings in particular, uh, for the war effort. Uh, Walker Blaine Beale was a grandson of uh, James Gillespie Beale uh, Blaine, uh, the former Speaker of the House and uh, Secretary of State that was from the state of Maine. Uh, he, uh, uh, Walker Blaine Beale, was you know, from an affluent family, uh, served, enlisted, volunteered to serve his country, and unfortunately didn't make it home himself. His uh, family decided that uh, after after his demise, that the state of Maine should 
be gifted the Blaine House because that was going to be his house. Um, and so that's how the governor's mansion ended up in, in the ownership of the state of Maine. General Pershing was the first official guest at the Blaine House. Uh, it was during this hero's tour um, uh, following the war. So I mentioned earlier there was a couple reasons why I, I, I particularly was, was interested in, in World War I and uh, some, some personal reflection reasons. But uh, this is Jane Jeffrey. Now Jane Jeffrey is um, unlike a lot of other nurses that served during World War I. Um, she was an English citizen that came to the U.S. to take care of her aunt and uncle who were living in Dorchester, Mass. Well, you know, she wasn't from Maine and she later removed herself to Maine following the war um, and lived out her final years, uh, the last several decades of her life, and she's buried in, in Poland, Maine. Uh, so she, she wanted to help out. Um, obviously, you know, I think a lot of it probably had to do with her English heritage. She had been looking at potential, potentially joining uh, the nurses uh, in, in early 1917, um, just before the war broke out as for the U.S. side of things. Um, she put her name in to, to actually serve, but because she was an English citizen and not a citizen of the United States, she couldn't be assigned to a Navy military uh, unit. So um, she said, all right, well, uh, I'll sign up for the Red Cross. Um, they didn't have a spot for her until uh, September of 1917. They said, actually, someone just said that they weren't going to be able to go overseas. They got sick or something along those lines and has withdrawn their candidacy. So would you be willing to go overseas? So in October of, of 1917, uh, uh, after filling out all of her paperwork and getting her inoculations and all that, she set forward on this ship, um, went overseas, was seasick for <laughs> For most of the time that she was going overseas. Most of the crew that were on the ship were French. She didn't speak French, um, so she had a hard time communicating even simple things. Um, they did take classes uh, during the course of the, the couple weeks they were on the ship in order to go over to Bordeaux, France. Um, when she disembarked and she, she was actually stationed at a hospital in Paris, at Newly, uh, just outside of Paris, um, but she, in her journal she talks about going to uh, various places. These are these are um, uh, spoils of war. The victors. Um, these are uh, German uh, artillery pieces and other things that were captured by French and English troops that were sent to Paris um, to, to show uh, the, the French citizens you know, what, what a great job they were doing uh, on the war. Um, she talked about a whole host of other things. This is the hospital that she was actually stationed at. Um, she eventually was assigned to a, a, a refugee hospital, it actually was a children's hospital, um, and here it is, it was a former hotel, it was at Avion, so it was on the Swiss border. Um, she was there for, for uh, a few months, and primarily she was there uh, as a nurse to help, you know, uh, undernourished kids, uh, kids who were sick, um, women who, you know, mothers of, of small children who um, really, they were refugees. I mean, they, these are people who were driven from their homes. They didn't have a home. They didn't have a village to return to. The, the men in their lives or others were gone because they'd been drafted or were killed. Um, and so she she stayed at this children's hospital, um, seeing the the you know the sickness and, and you know unfortunately death of, of a lot of kids. And she talks quite a bit about that in her journal. In, in uh, early June, uh, this is actually another picture of Jane right here. This picture actually came out of Radcliffe's uh, archives. This woman right here, Mrs. Pearsall, she was a, a fairly affluent person who volunteered her services um, before she was married. Um, and they actually had, just by chance, had this picture of her, uh, Jane Jeffrey. But uh, she was ended up sent to this other hospital. This was in a, a, a large mansion that the French had been using as a hospital for a couple years. Uh, it was outside of a railroad depot, so it was a good place to be able to um, send, send uh, sick uh, or, or injured troops back home or wherever they needed to send them to. Uh, so she was stationed at this place uh, and she complains about how there's no privacy. It's like living in a, in a fish tank. Um, these are the, the tents, uh, which were basically the hospital tents that were outside of, of that same hospital facility. So in, uh, in, in she talks about actually visiting this plane wreckage. I, I happen to be able to track down an image uh, of that, that particular plane that was shot down on, on June 23rd, 1918. 
But really interestingly, and what why it gives pause to examine her life is that the, the hospital that she was working at was bombed by the Germans. Um, and, uh, and this was not a, a common practice, but it did happen quite a bit, and especially at, at this juncture, um, in, in uh, the mid of, middle of July 1918, there was a great German offensive. It was really the last one um, that, that did push uh, the troops, the, the Allied troops, back quite a bit. Um, there, there was a, a considerable amount of damage that was um, done at this time, but, but there were uh, these soft targets as they were. It, it was kind of, uh, this is a picture, you can see the shrapnel that went through the tents. Um, and again, it, it, the interesting part though was that, I mean, it was clear that they were bombing hospitals at this particular time, uh, unfortunately. Um, they, they found, they, they got a couple down pilots, they had maps on them with X's right where the Red Cross hospitals were. The, the, the unfortunate part even was that uh, they were using things, obviously shrapnel bombs, not just bombs to blow things up. I mean, it was obviously for, for personnel damage more than anything else. There were Germans that were POWs that were actually at that same hospital that, that uh, um, she was at. So. So a, a number of a number were killed. Uh, two two died. Um, a, a number of others were injured. Uh, Jane Jeffrey received a, 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 a two-inch piece of shrapnel in her back, right next to her spinal cord. Um, she fell down, um, but refused to give up her post. Um, she tried to continue to muster some some uh, effort along, but it was clear that she was severely wounded. Um, they didn't actually think that she was going to survive. Uh, it was interesting because the day that this, this attack happened, she had written in her journal, and then about six weeks later, she's like, well, a lot of things have happened since six weeks ago, <laughs> the last time I wrote. Um, and she talks uh, explicitly about what had happened and the people who were nice to her, the people who were not nice to her or unhelpful to her. Um, so uh, this is a, a telegram that was sent to her, her uncle back in Dorchester, Mass., um, in, informing him that of, of her uh, injury. Uh, so this is what's called the Distinguished Service Cross. Now the, the Medal of Honor is obviously the nation's top uh, uh, military honor. This is the second. So the Distinguished Service Cross was is, is not just given out willy-nilly. There were no Medal of Honor winners from the state of Maine uh, during World War I. Um, but there were about 50 uh, recipients of the, this, this, the uh, Distinguished Service Cross. Jane Jeffrey is one of only a handful of women to ever receive that honor. Um, there were three that were given a, a Distinguished Service Cross during World War I, um, and, and here she is getting, uh, getting that honor uh, in, in March of, of 1919. She uh, uh, spent six, almost six months in the hospital. Uh, upon her return to the United States, again, even though she wasn't an American citizen, uh, she, because she wasn't in the mil a military hospital, they couldn't give her certain things. They couldn't give her a pension, they couldn't take care of certain uh, payments. They, they did supply her with some, some help and some assistance. Um, uh, again, this is a, a note uh, of her recipient. Uh, so she, um, she ended up working in a couple hospitals. She had a lot of psychological problems, of course, I mean, you know, uh, over a period of time. But she uh, ended up coming to Poland Springs, uh, and she worked in the bath department of Poland Spring Resort, where she met uh, 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 one of the owners of the Poland Spring Resort and married him. Uh, he, uh, she was his second wife. So this was the first time she had been married. Um, and she ended up living her life out on the property, and it is buried there. So it's a very interesting story. I've kind of smushed it together um, for, for time sensitivity. but. Uh, so obviously we're still in the midst of, of the centennial commemoration of World War I. Uh, there are some, some uh, resources that are out there. Uh, the U.S. Uh, wisely put together something uh, about five years ago, six years ago, I think it was 2012 when, when the piece of legislation went out. The state of Maine didn't do anything completely formal, although there's been a, a, a fairly frequent uh, but, but still somewhat informal commission that was put together about three years ago. Um, at, at several people's requests that have been doing a number of activities um, uh, throughout, throughout the state. Uh, some of them just presentations, obviously some publications and a few other things. So um, at the State uh, Museum there is an exhibit that will be 
uh, on display until I believe December of this year, uh, late December of this year. Um, certainly there's a number of other programs, um, but I'm, at this point I'm, I'm done and if you have any questions you feel free to, to ask anything. Like so thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions about anything? I have one. Excellent. Way back in the beginning, yes. it said that the pay was $30 a month. Mm -hmm. Was that very low or modest or how did it fit in? No, I think that was it was a decent amount of money. Um, you know, I think. Uh, what do you know? 20, what that would be in today's. Uh, let's see. I would. No, I'm not sure right off the top of my head. I don't want to venture a guess. I can. I can think about. I know certain time periods, and that's not one where I would say a dollar is equal to whatever. But it's probably close to ten dollars more. Uh, ten times. So you know, it'd be like three hundred dollars a month. It's not. It's not a lot of money. Obviously, I wonder how much uh, that would be. the CCC program they didn't receive, and that was per month. That was about the same amount that they received 20 years later. Mm -hmm. World War II pay was $21 a month. So there you go. Well, yeah, this was $30 in World War One. That's a that's a shame. <laughs> but it may have been a bonus too. Who knows? Um, and it may have been partly that. But it's interesting. $21, huh? Goodness. That's not a lot of money. I don't remember my grandfather. Pretty good. It does sound. Absolutely. Absolutely. There were some other questions. Yes. The uh, influenza epidemic. Ah, yes. It keeps coming up, but I should do something about that. I haven't. So, yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. Killed a lot more soldiers, I believe, than yes. actually died in World War One yes. on the American side, at least. Yep. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, so uh, so the the, uh, the influenza pa uh, pandemic uh, was really f the fall of 18, and it obviously went into the spring of 19 and through the summer, um, and uh, that certainly is where a number of so the uh, of the three Scarborough sons that didn't make it back, two of them died from that, and it was in the fall of 18. So I think one died in September. Uh, uh, the Libby soldier died in October, and the other one, I think it was Gower, died in December of, of 1918. Um, but certainly, it, it was a tremendous situation, um, and you know, and, and it was not just Europe, obviously. I mean, it was in the U.S. had a, a number of difficulties with that. Yeah. My wife's dad uh, shipped over in World War One. He was gassed over there. Yeah. My, my great uncle, uh, he was from Gardner. Uh, he went to Bowdoin. He graduated when he was like 15. Uh, very smart man. He moved to Philadelphia, worked for Bell Telephone, uh, and uh, was uh, uh, signed up with the, the Blue Division, uh, Blue Mountain Division. And he was on a sanitary train, and he, he was gassed. And um, it, it, uh, talking with my grandparents, he, was, he would just be, you know, he didn't come home well. And you know, to be honest, and um, they weren't that far from Togus, I mean, literally miles away from Togus, and um, and it, it, he just couldn't get the help he really needed. But there, there wasn't a lot they could do either. So yes, the shells that were produced at yeah. the Portland Company. Yeah, it occurred. Were they shipped over with the explosive in them, or did they put them? Have any idea? Yeah, no, so there, there's a fuse that goes in it. There's, so there would be a fuse that you put in it. So it would, they, they, I mean, they're live, so to speak, but they're not completely live. So it depends on the shell as well, because the, the idea is that you, you're shooting it. Some, some things are, are on a time fuse, some things are not. So it would be as soon as there's an impact. Um, so it would really depend, but they're not, they're not inert. You know, so certainly they're they're alive, so to speak. So they're yeah. they're they're ready to put into action. Yeah, uh, pretty pretty much. Yeah. Pretty close. Any other questions? I don't have a question. That's okay. I have trivia. Oh, good. Are you gonna ask me or ask everyone? Well, I don't know. You know, I don't know much about World War One, uh, the history of it, and even though I did have two great uncles who served in. In World War One, and I knew all of those boys 
and I, my regret is that I never asked any questions at the time. Mm -hmm. And a story that I had heard at one point was one of the brothers had been wounded, was in the hospital. Uncle Randall. Uncle Randall. He was gassed. And he was in the hospital, and Uncle Otis uh, found him. And Uncle Otis was in the Navy. Yeah. Yeah. So you know that's just connections sure. that I have with World War One. So, and also I started watching Downton Abbey. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a fairly timely yeah. series, well, last, right? I mean, last, night, <laughs> sure. last night was the first night they got into World War One in the trenches, and so you showed that picture there of the trenches, and I thought, phew, you know, the bombs and everything. Sure. So I think I have to learn a little bit more about World War One. So PBS came out with a, a, a series of things last year. I think, I don't know if it was last, yeah, it would have been last April. Gosh, it would have been a year. Um, and there were, I think it was a three-part, maybe mm -hmm. maybe four. Uh, it, was a, it was a really good documentary that talked particularly about the U.S.'s involvement. But there are, you know, the interesting part about this particular war is, and I, on, on a personal level, I have I don't know, uh, too many, thousands of World War I era images that are not necessarily U.S. Interestingly, because the U.S. timeline was so short, there's just not a lot of U.S. stuff. A lot of the U.S. stuff is, here we are at training camp, and here we are at the whatever, or, and, and a lot of them are still in state, they're not overseas. Um, there's not a lot of French, or there's not a lot of British, there's actually tons of German photographs and the reason is is that the British um, uh, had, had had a prohibition on carrying a camera um, uh, so a lot of the officers when it first initially happened they, they brought a camera with them because it was relatively cheap uh, and there and I wish I would have brought it but they're I mean my phone is about the same size it's just they're a little bit thicker the, uh, the, the best pocket Kodaks that they had so um, and, and they were pretty cheap but you know the, the English forces, the French forces were kind of against that. But the Germans didn't seem to care as much. I, I, again, I'm not sure why. So, um, so there's so much uh, photographic evidence of, of what was going on overseas, um, and uh, there were a number of, of documentaries that were but live action. I mean, you can go on YouTube right now, and you will find uh, a number of. British and German films that were shot live action of, of, of scenes of the war. And they're not staged things. They're not, you know, oh, we threw something up in the air and it kind of, we just jumped out of the trench. I mean, they're, they're really, the, it, the camera was rolling. Um, and, the, and there were a series of those films and I, it's, it's not as graphic, gra I mean, the whole thing's graphic, obviously, but it's not, you're not focusing in on you know, somebody ha a casualty or something along those lines. They're they're fairly uh, landscape and fairly back, but uh, it's very interesting. And, and there's there's a lot of documentation for World War One, and of course it gets you know ramps up as time is going on. Too. So. Okay, yes. These two, oh. Excuse me. These two. Just one more thing. <laughs> uh, these two boys were uh, were born and lived in Dunstan. Okay. Scott. Sure. Thank you. Yes. My grandfather uh, is from, grew up in St. Louis and joined the Marines as a doctor uh, yes. in World War One. And uh, I remember him very well, the doc, we called him. And he was a wonderful guy. And he would talk about his times over there, but he actually was able to take a camera with him. Yep. And ended up taking an awful lot of photographs, which I've inherited because I've been like you, yeah, that somebody's guy. Yeah. Uh, that guy yeah. right, in the family. Yeah. And some of them are amazing, and he obviously had a very good time, but one of the stories he did tell in, in a letter home was how he was standing on guard duty one night, or not, not guard duty, he and a buddy were just out, just standing there, and he was talking to him, and they might have been smoking or whatever, but um, his friend was very quiet, he turned and looked, and he was missing half his head. Mm -hmm. And no sound or anything, he said, sure. just drop down beside him. And, uh, but other than that, he was, again, a surgeon, so he was doing all that kind of thing. And he had a very positive overall experience with it. And he was a Mueller, actually. His family were very German mm, sure. <laughs> in this country, and he was over in Germany mm. at that time. 
It's, uh, you know, I, uh, you, you mentioned his, his situation. I, I, Ralph Spaulding was the first, uh, one of, if not the first National Guard member uh, in the entire country to be killed, and he was, he was from Maine. He, he, he only uh, died in action a, a couple months after uh, Corporal Andrews did. Um, the, the reason why he ended up dying was uh, he was, he had this thing, uh, he, he jumped out, they, they were under attack, and he, he lost his hat, and he was like, oh, I gotta get my hat, and went back to get his hat and, and shot. Um, not exactly the same situation, certainly, but it was just one of those freak things that happened, right? Um, so, there was any other, yes? Well, another Scarborough connection to World War One would be uh, Henry Welch and his wife Adelaide, who lived on, on Point Road in Nelson. And he was in the Navy in World War One. Mm -hmm. He was actually a career Navy man. Prior to World War One, he was in the Great White Fleet. Oh, sure. Teddy Roosevelt's time that went around the world. But um, when the war came, he asked Adelaide if she would wait for him. And she did. And he survived. And he was involved in the many ships that were taking supplies back mm -hmm. and forth. Excellent, thank you. And I have some of the little medals and things he got from that. Wow, that's awesome. I remember him so well. Yes. I, I can recommend highly a man who um, <clears throat> runs a business now. He was a history professor for a long time in southern England. And he's a Welshman by birth. Um, he does these oak tours of the World War One sites, and he he will take a busload if, if there's a busload of people who want to go. But his preference is to use his very comfortable vehicle, so he does all the planning and and the hoteling. And he will do a specific tour for whatever you wish to see and be educated of. I was not particularly interested. My father was a Canadian soldier in World War I and was in with the Prince Edward Island men. There were about 250 of them, the first regiment to sign up in Canada. And I have minutes, journals, mm. that were done for the leader of that group. Um, you know, I'd start to read them and get bored and put them away, and eventually thought, I've got to find something out about this. This man did us a tour for my family that took us exactly where I wanted to go to trace, trace the, sure. and we had the specifics. I had the specifics from day to day to day. He will do a tour for whatever you want. And I I wanted to do it because my dad's map, if you will, was then overlaid by my husband's World War II mm. map. That I thought was striking sure. similarity, just chilling. So this guy does singlestepptours.com is is very personal and very worthwhile if anybody wishes to pursue that history and knowledge on Where is he located? He he is he lives he's in southern England. Okay. Now he's a Welshman and uh, he uses his Land Rover, so you want you to have a comfort. That's awesome. You go as as many hours as you wish during the day. And for someone like myself, I didn't want to go and try to navigate, you know, the hotels all alone, or even, you know, with the younger kids. And uh, so it's a great way that he's he's even gone down to help excavate the trenches that are still being. Yeah, there's, there's a doctor, and I forget where he is, uh, and uh, he's been, uh, there's a number of underground caves uh, where they were, uh, and it was Germans that were using it, the French that were using it, um, a lot of members of the 103rd Regiment from Maine, so they would carve things in uh, to, to the rock, and they're, you know, they leave 103rd, or 
would say Catalyst Maine or it was a Passamaquoddy member uh, would, would carve out a you know a tribal figure uh, a whole host of things and, it's, and of course it's, I've taken particular interest in, interest in his work because you know because of the main connection more than anything else but I mean it's just amazing what, what, what they're still I mean there's red zones that they can't they still can't go to over a hundred years later but there's just so much artillery shells and other things that are there there's they're digging they still have special teams in Belgium and France that go because somebody's kicked something else up and they have to go and defuse it. And they're World War One. they're not World War Two shells. So that's, that's, it's still, I mean, and this is going on, and this is going to, and they estimate that it'll be a couple hundred more years before they're not pulling up World War One ones, let alone World War II. So, anyways, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much.